Good evening. Welcome to our study tonight. Tonight we're going to go right into in the news, and there are, there are obviously a lot of news, but we're going to pick the ones out that relate to prophecy. This one's under New World Order, and it's about the UN. The UN Pact for the Future could set the stage for global government. Now, if you know anything about prophecy, obviously global government fits right hand in hand with it. On September 13th, the United Nations member states completed the fourth draft of the Pact for the Future document, which is expected to be signed this weekend uh, at the Summit for the Future in New York City. I should say last weekend, and it was signed. The public is unlikely to see the final version of the document before it's signed by all 193 member states of the UN. This, it shifts financial resources to rapidly complete the Agenda 2030 uh, goals set by the UN in 2015. You've heard me talk about that. Despite, despite the lack of transparency on the final draft of the pact, noteworthy changes were made from the third to the fourth revision. Protocols for convening and opera, uh, operationalizing emergency platforms. Think about those two worlds. Emergency platforms based on flexible approaches to respond to a range of different complex global shocks including phasing out emergency platforms ensuring that emergency platforms are convened for a finite period and will not be standing institution or entity what they're saying is when there's a global global crisis they want to take control of the world that's what this these uh, emergency platforms are uh, ensure that the convening of emergency platforms support and complements the response of United Nations principles, United Nations coordination, entities, and mechanisms. In other words, countries lose their sovereignty and the United Nations takes over. It's a one world government. The third draft of the pact claimed that the emergency platforms would only be convened for a finite period. That's a lie. And would not be a standing institution or entity with respect to the national sovereignty. That's a lie. And the way you can tell it's a lie is we had we had, a, uh, we had a, a law enacted after 9-11, and it was a security law to track terrorists. That was supposed to be only for a little time. Now it's being used to track Americans. Uh, discussion of global shocks and calls for emergency platform are reminiscent to previous calls for the UN to declare planetary emergency. So think about it. The UN is setting itself up to be able to declare a planetary emergency, have emergency platforms, take away the sovereignty of nations, and rule the world and so basically 193 nations signed this thing so it's kind of interesting now i'm not sure where the teeth are in it to enact it but it goes on it says this we can trace the call for a planetary emergency back to the infamous <clears throat> excuse me but obscure group called the club of rome and if you've never heard of them you really need to do a little research the club of rome's emergency plan is described as a quote roadmap for governments and other stakeholders to shift our societies and economies to bring back balance between people, planet, and prosperity. You can't get any more New Agey, you can't get any more New World Order than that. Uh, the, the fourth edition of the pact also mentions a controversial financial to, tool known as debt swaps, or debt for nature swaps. The swaps are financial agreements in which conservative organizations or governments reduce restructures or purchases a country's debt at a discount in exchange for investments in cons conservation of land. What does that mean? It means they'll pull you out of debt if your economy is bad, your country's economy is bad, if you give them your land. They want to swap your land. That means they want to own the land that we're on and every country's on. It's pretty scary. I mean, again, I don't know where the teeth are in it. I'm not sure how they're going to enact it, but the fact that they're actually proposing it and signing it is pretty scary. Let's talk about Israel just for a little bit. Obviously, things are heating up quite a bit in Israel. I've been talking to my friends every week and it is not good. Uh, over 100,000 Israelis have been displaced from the Golan Heights and from uh, the Tiberias, Sea of Galilee. Uh, they're actually flooding all the, all the hotels and Hezbollah is now striking with precision missiles. And so uh, it's not really good and basically I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for any day to hear something happen. Unfortunately, our news media and the cycle of our news media doesn't even con concern itself with it. It's more involved with our, with our politics, which I'm really kind of tired of. And we get no world news. So we don't know what's happening. It's much, much worse than you could possibly imagine. This article talks about this. Hezbollah's entire senior command level likely demand, de uh, excuse me, damaged. So as the dust sails from the mass pager and radio communications blasts that rocked Hezbollah in Lebanon on Tuesday and Wednesday, last week respectively, and caused thousands of injuries and dozens of deaths in the ranks of the Iran-backed terror army. Observers have begun to assess the damage incurred by the Islamist, Islamist group. 
Hezbollah's uh, Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah acknowledged that his organization absorbed an unprecedented blow to its personnel and security, adding that there was no dispute that, quote, the enemy has technological superiority, and they do. Nasrallah and other Hezbollah leaders have vowed retribution and retaliation. The historic attack has severely disrupted Hezbollah's operational infrastructure by taking thousands of commanders off the battlefield due to injuries, hundreds of them severe, while eliminating much of its ability to communicate with field operatives, since pages were meant to be a safer replacement for smartphones, which the group considers to be too vulnerable to, to espionage. So I told you last week, what they did is they changed out their, page, their, their cell phones to pagers, and Israel got hold of them before they were shipped to them. They knew of the order, and they, they orchestrated little bombs next to the batteries, and it was controlled by one little, one little microwave, controlled all of them, and it blew them up. Israel did it because they were going to do that uh, in, in lieu of, or actually they were going to do that in, a, in response to a ground attack. So they were going to ground attack and do that at the same time because it disrupts everything. But they felt that Hezbollah was getting knowledge of it, so they blew them up prematurely. But... The historic attack has severely disrupted Hezbollah's operational infrastructure by taking thousands of commanders off the battlefield. As such, the damage to Hezbollah's command structure, communications, infrastructure, and morale is considered extremely significant, damaging the organization's ability to function confidently. If you just look at the persons who are carrying those beepers, this is probably the senior commanders and above. So it's from the bat battalion commanders and above. So probably what is happening now in Hezbollah is that all commanding structure form, let's say the rank of a lieutenant colonel in a regular military to the generals, the two or three generals, are totally injured or some of them are already dead. The surprise attack left Hezbollah on its knees. Hezbollah operatives in Syria were also hurt in a pager blast. And on September 9th, international media report said Israel's special forces and aircraft struck an IRGC missile site in Hema, western Syria, which was designed to produce accurate missiles for Hezbollah. The attack uh, harmed the group's ability to get hold of its kits to make the bombs more accurate, uh, the rocket accuracy program. On July 31st, the Israeli Air Force killed Hezbollah's second-in-command, Thaud Shuker, considered the organization's top military operative. The strike and, like, and others like it showcased very precise, very accurate, very good intelligence, and amazing intelligence. Barak Gonin, senior lecturer at the Jerusalem College of Technology and a former cybersecurity official in the Israeli Defense Forces told Jerusalem News that in theory, getting a remote device to run a malicious code requires uploading the code into the device before execution, which is an immense task if done remotely. And that's exactly what Israel did. Speaking of Israel, let's talk about some fines. This is Jerusalem's ancient culture validated. Of course, there's a lot of there's a lot of talk back and forth about it. The Jews not not owning that land, not being uh, being uh, not being residents of the land. Uh, Hamas and and Islamic Jihad and and Hezbollah say that Israel is trespassing on the land. They never owned it. Well, archaeology continues to prove them wrong. Jerusalem archaeologists uh, digging the first temple structures near the Temple Mount made a very interesting discovery. The first temple period dates to the time of the biblical kings of Israel. An archaeologist unearthed a seal from that time that belonged to a Jewish governor of Jerusalem. <clears throat> the seal would likely have been used to stamp important documents and was probably on a, worn on a chain or a string around the official's neck. What's particularly relevant is that this seal supports two important claims. First, it validates the Bible's description of governors over Jerusalem during the time of the ancient kingdoms of Judah. The Bible refer, refers to governors of Jerusalem serving under both King Hezekiah and King Josiah. That's 2 Kings 23.8. Second, this find validates the history of the Israelites, not only as inhabitants of Judea, but also as rulers of Jerusalem over 2,500 years ago and across successive generations of Jewish kings. Today, critics increasingly question the validity of the Bible and claim that the Jews are relatively newcomers to the Holy Land. And social engineers of all stripes work tirelessly to distance the moral, moral and historical document known as the Bible from public consciousness, slandering it as being an untrustworthy untrust, witness to human history. Yet archaeology continues to unearth evidence after evidence that validates biblical claims. Let me go a little bit further here and tell you a little bit about war. You know, I've been talking to people that I know, some of my friends, family, and telling about how close I personally feel 
that we are to a nuclear exchange. And every time I read something, it gets me more, uh, more concerned about a nuclear exchange. This article says nuclear war is much, much closer than we dare imagine. Nu nuclear war is much closer than we dare imagine was a sobering title of an article in the Telegraph. The article of August 21st, the article outlines Russian, Chinese, and North Korean nuclear advances and discusses Russians' new work on nuclear-related space-based technology about which few details are known. This long-term nuclear threat from space is something U.S. policy markers have been unable to slow down. Several mistakes U.S. leaders have made in recent years, such as allowing China to increase its nuclear arsenal from 300 to 500 warheads, a number that's likely to double again by 2030. Analysts are calling for Western nations to rebuild and modernize their own arsenals and to do so as quickly as possible. It's interesting. I remember when John F. Kennedy was giving a speech at Washington University. It was one of the most powerful speeches. Uh, it, was a, it was a handout. It was an olive branch to Russia. And he was asking for de-arming, uh, disarming all of their nuclear weapons as well as us, everyone around the world. And uh, nuclear de -arm, uh, to disarm, and it was a pact that they, they actually signed and started to do. He wanted to have no more war, is what he said. The nuclear game playing out among many nations today is a reminder that we live in an unprecedented period with conditions that have never ever existed before. Jesus foretold that if he does not return, quote, no flesh would be saved. Obviously, to me, that's a nuclear exchange. It's Matthew 22, 24, 22. The possibility of human annihilation did not exist until the advent of nuclear weapons. That was roughly 80 years ago. Without the hope of Christ's intervention, this world appears to be headed towards the oblivion. Read Revelation. Matter of fact, go on, on my site, Mark Crowell Ministries, or even on YouTube, and you can see the Revelation study. Deep into the Revelation study, you'll find out that there's a, there's a looks like a nuclear exchange during the seven year tribulation. I can't come up with anything else. When the Bible also talks about Damascus being destroyed in one hour, that can't happen with conventional weapons. So we're talking about something that's very, very on the cusp of, of our lives. Speaking again of, of war, Cold War pales in comparison to multi-phase threats from China. U.S. government and military officials are warning us of China's increased military buildup, satellite capabilities, and government-sponsored hacking activity taking place against American targets, with one official stating that the current threat posed by Xi Jinping's communist regime exceeds what, what occurred during the Cold War. China and Russia are working hard hand-in-hand in hand to bolster each other's military capabilities. In return for China's substantial support of Russia's military industry, including supporting its drone capabilities in its ongoing war in Ukraine, Putin is reportedly supplying Xi with submarine and missile technology. They're going in together. Increasing the speed of designing and building U.S. warships is the most important thing that we need to do over the course of the next 10 years, because we haven't built any in a long, long time. Air Force Security Frank uh, Secretary Frank Kendall warned on Monday, past Monday, that due to China's continued military buildup in space, quote, the likelihood of war in the Pacific is increasing and will continue to do so. In light of the threats, Republican congressmen are urging the Biden-Harris administration to protect land around U.S. military installations from being snapped up by Chinese entities. The China, Chinese are buying land around our military, uh, military bases, and we're letting them. Xi Jinping would never allow Americans to buy land next to sensitive Chinese bases. Unfortunately, current U.S. policy all too often rolls out the red carpet for CCP land purchases. Meanwhile, attacks on U.S. institutions continue to mount in the form of a China-sponsored hackers. FBI Director Christopher Wray detailed how the Flax Typhoon Hacking Group recently posted an information security company and targeted government agencies, media organizations, and universities in order to obtain intelligence and conduct reconnaissance. During the attack, more than 126,000 American internet-connected devices, such as cameras, video recorders, and storage devices, were compromised. According to former U.S. counterintelligence official Kerry Gershenek, a group called Spamflage is impersonating U.S. voters to denigrate U.S. politicians and push de divisive messages ahead of the November 5th election. Uh, election interference. Through accounts on X, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok, the group posted on topics including reproductive rights and homelessness and geopolitical issues such as Americans backing for Ukraine and Israel. TikTok pushing thousands of videos. By the way, 
If you didn't know, a TikTok is Chinese owned, and uh, they're, they're, they uh, report back to the Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party. TikTok pushing thousands of videos with political lines and hyperbole to its users. There have been no indictments or other actions by the Justice Department, by the Treasury Department, or the State Department against the Chinese regime for election interference offenses, and there should be. And this one's kind of shocking. I'm going to give you one that you probably heard about from the Pope. It's under religion. Then I'm going to give you something extremely shocking that I found out. This article says Pope Francis crosses all red lines with claims all religions are a path to God. Pope Francis has made several questionable statements over the years, causing people to debate just what he meant by certain words. However, this time, he made it pretty clear what he believes about the exclusivity of the gospel and now has many Catholics questioning how this man can be Pope while contradicting the core tenets of faith. During a three-day visit to Singapore and while attending the uh, interreligious meetings with young people at a Catholic junior college, Pope Francis departed from his prepared remarks and declared to the gathering that, quote, every religion is a way to arrive at God. That is blasphemous. Jesus said there's only one way to get to God. It's through the hymn. He continued, sort of a comparison example, he said, would be they're sort of like different languages in order to arrive at God. That absolutely makes no sense at all. And again, it's blasphemous. This is the leader though of the world's 1.4 billion Catholics. He continued along this universal, universalist track by saying, quote, but God is God for all. And if God is God for all, we are all sons and daughters of God. He lamented that some argue, but my God is more important than your God. And then he asked, is that true? So he goes on. And let me remind you that Jesus didn't say, go out and point people towards any random religion or philosophy, nor did he offer any prompt that affirms all religions are path to God. The Pope's claims simply do not stand up to the Bible's historical and theological narrative or the Catholics. And even an atheist understands this reality. The proclamation is absolutely head turning. Show stomping a moment considered slipping slip from the lips of the man who has the world's largest Christian denomination. Critics were quick to appropriately react in sheer horror and frustration with collective rebuke. If Francis is correct, one, one cardinal said, then Jesus was wrong when he stated, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. By the way, it's John 14, 6. The false doctrine which Francis proclaimed has been around for centuries, but Jesus did not die on a cross to merely provide one more way of getting to God. He died for our sins because it was the only way we could be reconciled to our Father in heaven. The world wants Christians to embrace the false gospel that Pope Francis unashamedly presents as truth. The world is unable to comprehend the true gospel. And without the working of the Holy Spirit, you and I would never understand and believe the gospel. We need to pray for Pope Francis, and I'm going to get hard on him in a second, but to repent for his false teaching and come to know the true gospel. This is no minor doctrine. It's a foundational issue for every professing believer and every professing church body. Francis previously faced criticism and accusations on heresy on social media back in May for claiming that the human heart is fundamentally good during a 60 minutes interview. He said, people are fundamentally good. We're all fundamentally good. There are some rogues and sinners, but the heart of man is good. That is a direct lie from scripture. The Bible says the heart of man is evil continually. At the time, many commentators and ex-criticized Francis for his remarks, with some accusing him of failing to grasp the basic teachings of the gospel. Others quote portions of scripture that teach God alone is good and humanity has a sinful nature. Some ex-users note that Francis' comments appeared to be an example of Pelagianism. It's a fifth century heresy that denied original sin and taught the essential goodness of humanity. Pope Francis, I'm gonna give you my opinion, he's a humanist, he's woke, he, he's a heretic. He has no place in the body of Christ, period. And if you want proof of that, this next article should shock you as it shocked me. I dug this up. It's kind of amazing. Francis, let me give you a little background. I, be, I was Catholic until I was 19 years old. For, and I went to Catholic school, went to Mass every day before school, was an altar boy for five years, learned Latin. I know the Catholic, Catholic faith very inside out. Pope Francis is supposed to sit in the seat of Peter. He's supposed to be the representative of Christ on earth. He is the successor of Peter that the Catholics believe was the first Pope. There's no proof of that. They went back to the bishops of Rome and he wasn't even that. And they claimed Peter was the first Pope. So Pope Francis is supposed to be the vicar of Christ. He, when he sits in the papal throne and makes a decree, it's supposed to be coming right from Christ. 
He is the, again, successor of Peter. So he sits in the seat of Peter and of Christ, uh, the succession from Peter. And he is the head of 1.4 billion Catholics. He is supposedly holding the keys of the kingdom. The keys were given to Peter, supposedly. And now Francis holds them, just as every pope succeeding Peter held. So he holds the keys to the kingdom. Now, this article says this, and I'm going to show you the pictures. Lightning strikes St. Peter's statue on Pope Francis's birthday. This is crazy. Lightning struck a statue of St. Peter on Pope Francis's birthday last December 17th. Again, Francis is the successor of Peter. On Sunday, December 17th, lightning literally pulverized the keys and halo of the statue of St. Peter located on the facade of the sanctuary of Our Lady of the Rosary of San Nicolas, north of Buenos Aires, Argentina. What is striking, though, in fact, is that the event occurred on Jorge Mario Bergoglio's birthday. That's Pope's real name. The day before the publication of the Fiducia Supplications Declaring, which opens up blessings for gay couples. This thing struck on his birthday, on the day before he opens up blessings for gay couples. Now, lightning not only happened during Francis' birthday, and one day before the publication of the controversial document, Fiducia Supplicanus, but it's also in his home diocese. This is where this guy used to, used to be. Ber uh, Bergoglio was Archbishop and Cardinal of Buenos Aires. The Lepanto Institute sent someone to the location to take pictures and confirm the event. You're looking at it. The December 17th strike is confirmed. And these are the pictures that I wanted to show you. There's the keys in Peter's right hand. They're blown off and his hand is now withered. There's the halo symbolizing holiness and spiritual, spirituality. The halo is blown off and it's gone. Is God telling us that the Pope Francis is no longer any representation of holiness or any representation of the keys of the kingdom? I believe he is. That should have been on world news. It wasn't. All right, let's go a little bit further. Christian conservatives are slowly being purged from America's military. The Army's longstanding training aimed at discouraging personnel and from discriminating against people based on their race and sex is the age of wokeism during the Biden-Harris administration. It's now morphing into a new and bizarre anti-discrimination par paradigm reflecting an extremist, leftist, and fundamentally anti-Christian ideology. The Army conducts a mandatory annual briefing on racism and sexual harassment. Up until the current era, they were all very standard and straightforward, sharing the commonly accepted view that no one should be treated disrespectfully because of the color of their skin. You'll hear it a lot in places in the U.S., especially in the South, that people will say their religion prohibits transgenderism and homosexuality. Shockingly, if a soldier in the U.S. Army expresses this traditional biblical morality publicly, they'll be in violation of Army policy and against Army values. For such a violation, a service member could get a poor evaluation and a reprimand at the very least. You could be considered a bad character, a death blow to your career. Should command decide to pursue such an accusation, there'd be very little recourse for the accused. These are the kinds of things that can now get you out of the army very quickly. Just claiming that you are a Christian and you don't believe in, that homosexuality is right. These races developments as part of a deliberate effort to ideologically influence U.S. troops through their training. All military training theoretically exists to enhance fighting readiness. Training is supposed to be ideologically neutral. What counts for extremism under these new policies? According to a speech given by President and Commander-in-Chief Joe Biden in Philadelphia on September 1st, 2022, anyone who holds to traditional sexual ethic or who has a moral objection to abortion, I'm quoting, or simply voted for Donald Trump fits the category of an extremist. I'm not really sure why Kamala Harris has even one supporter, let alone as many as she has. If you fit any of these criteria and you're in the military today, you know how to keep your head down and mouth shut if you want to preserve your career. The Army's efforts to mount a steady purge of Christian conservatives from America's military ranks. One of the more recent cases had Liberty Council fighting the Idaho Na Army National Guard and demanding the organization restore the career of an infantry officer who was removed from command and legally pressured to resign because of a soldier's complaints about the officer's statements regarding his personal Christian beliefs. We need to read our word. Pagan armies never fare well in the Bible, ever. And if we want a pagan army, it's not going to help us a bit. 
Let's go a little bit to technology, my last one tonight. And we've heard a lot about it. I don't think most people understand AI is out of hand and it's going to get worse and worse. And people tell me, well, it's just a computer program. It's, it's done by engineers and people. No, AI is starting to get self-sufficient. Everything's telling us that. And I got to read this. Artificial intelligence, AI, is taking the world by storm. You can now use AI to learn languages, translate documents, compose music, and even write term papers for the school or books. AI is everywhere, but its potential for danger and harm is still not fully understood and is often underestimated. In a recent report published in the journal Patterns, researchers studied multiple AI types and found that many employed lies and deception to succeed at their tasks. Even when programmers worked to steer the AI toward being honest and truthful, the AI still lied. So programmers aren't doing it. Listen, as the deceptive capabilities of AI systems become more advanced, the dangers they pose to society will become increasingly serious. In a world that's becoming remarkable, remarkably dependent on AI-driven technology, and in a world where so many people readily believe all the information they are fed by their computers or smartphones, it's not difficult to imagine where this computer-generated deception could lead. Nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ stated that Satan the devil is a liar and the father of lies, John 8, 44. Centuries earlier, the prophet Isaiah warned of a coming time defined by widespread deception. I'm quoting it. No one calls for justice, nor does anyone plead for truth. They trust in empty words and they speak lies. They conceive evil and they bring forth iniquity, Isaiah 59, 4. Who would have guessed the technology created by mankind would not only assist in the propagation of lies, but also begin to generate its own lies. As we look around the world and we see computer programs acting more and more like human beings, the, pre question, the pressing question becomes, where will it all lead? That's in the news for tonight. and I.